title of the sermon is Nicodemus the Pharisee. And so I want to really emphasize that point, and that's what the message is going to be about, is that uh, Nicodemus here was a Pharisee. So we're going to look a little bit about what a Pharisee is and, and how that applies to us today. Um, but to start with, this story raises a lot of questions. And in Iola this morning for Sunday school, I actually uh, we're going verse by verse through John. And so we, you know, we looked at these things real deeply. I won't necessarily have time to do all that. But I do want to bring out a few thoughts here from this passage where we see Nicodemus and somewhat of a peculiar character. Like in this Bible, there's, to me, there's always been a lot of questions uh, as to what happened exactly. So, you know, one of the first questions you might have in this passage is, is uh, why did he come to Jesus at night? Why did Nicodemus come at night time to see Jesus? Or I should say this, why does it emphasize that? It seems to bring that point out. Uh, you know, that he came at night, and it seems like, uh, you know, what, does he just work a full day's job, and then, so, hey, I don't have time during the day, but at night, I'll go ahead and, and, and talk to Jesus. Well, I think the Bible actually gives some pretty good insight as to why it was that he came to Jesus at night. So, let's, real quick, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, real quickly, give some background, just in case anybody has this thought, we could kind of clarify that a little bit, little bit. Chapter 11, verse 45. <clears throat> chapter 11 of course John 11 is where we see the resurrection of Lazarus and so Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead uh, obviously that's a huge miracle that's something that anyone that observed that and watched that knowing good and well that Lazarus was dead and knowing that he was in the tomb for, for four days and then seeing this happen, no doubt would have made them think, well, maybe this is the Son of God. Maybe this is the Messiah. All right, but let's read, starting verse 45. It says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. It's real obvious by reading this what their, their problem was, like why they were afraid that people would turn to Jesus, you know. And so it, I, I believe a lot of them probably in their heart said, hmm, this is probably the Messiah. Like, I mean, every, every evidence is there, but they're trying to make excuses, and so they're going to say things like, well, yeah, but... But he's from Galilee, and we know Jesus is supposed to be from Bethlehem. Well, yeah, he was born in Bethlehem, but, you know, then he was raised in Galilee. And they're just like, you know, well, surely that he's not doing this, or, you know, he's healing on the Sabbath day. Or they're throwing all these things out here to try to, you know, just get people to think that he's not the Messiah. But the real motivation was, if people embrace him, then the Romans are going to be mad at us and say, like, oh, here's a king, and so we're going to go to war, and we're going to be kicked out of our position. How sick, you know, that somebody would think that way. But we're going to look at the, some passages here in a minute that show why somebody could be so blinded and be so, it'd be so weird that they, would, that they would do that, even in the face of, of knowing who this man was to some degree. Look back at chapter 9. John 9, verse 20. Great story where the blind man receives a sight by Jesus and uh, doesn't completely understand what's going on or who Jesus was. Uh, he knows of him probably, but doesn't know all the details and, and just says, hey, all I know is that I was blind and now I see. Of course, in this word, the Pharisees, again, because they're thinking, oh, no, now people are going to be following this Jesus. All right, so starting verse 20, chapter 9, verse 20, he says, his, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth we know not, or who hath opened his eyes. We know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. And verse 22 says, And these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So you start reading between the lines and see like it was really big deal that they were, you know, careful to openly embrace Jesus because of the fact that they're going to be 
um, you know, shunned and kicked out of the synagogue and, and treated, you know, family's going to reject them. This is why the preaching so much to the disciples was, hey, you're going to be hated of your own families and all this kind of stuff because this is exactly what happened to those who followed Christ. And so, uh, so I believe that this is a good explanation why Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, hey, so that the other Pharisees can't see him coming, you know, so the religious leaders of the day won't, won't know that he came to him. But he, I think he came in all sincerity, really wanting to know from Jesus, you know, what, what was going on here. So look at John chapter 3. <clears throat> so there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now this is interesting that he's, I, I think it's interesting that he said, we know. Like, I don't think he was just, you know, like, I mean, maybe he was. He was a theologian, right? <laughs> Preachers often say we, like, like we're going to preach to you today. And really what I mean is I'm going to preach to you. <laughs> so sometimes that's what happens. But no, why did he say we? I feel like there were other Pharisees as well who were believing, like, wait a minute. There's something more to this guy than just like an imposter or something like that. There's something to this guy. So I feel like Nicodemus is talking on behalf of, other Pharisees and other people who are wondering and questioning, like, is this really him? In fact, I'm going to throw this out here real quick in uh, John 3.16, famous verse, right? You're, you're familiar with it. Uh, he says, uh, what does he say? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, no, that's not the one I'm looking for. Uh, what I'm looking for is verse 7, sorry. Uh, but you understand the whole idea about being born again. And then he says, you know, you have to believe in, in Jesus. Okay. But when he says being born again, and I'm I don't know, I probably won't have time to explain this or we'll be here forever, but like I said, in Sunday school, I've talked a lot about it. I'll probably talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but he says, Marvel not that I, say, that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, if, you're, if you don't have a King James Bible, you would probably skip right over this because it goes from singular to plural. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Well, who's the ye? Who's he talking about? Well, he's probably talking about who Nicodemus was referring when he said, we know that thou art a, a teacher sent by God. Okay, so, so it's kind of like he's answering, hey, you know what you guys need to do? You need to stop wondering, you stop questioning, and you need to put your faith in me. And so uh, this seems to be the, what's going on as Nicodemus comes to Jesus and asks him these questions. So somebody might ask, well, did he get saved? Did Nicodemus get saved? I personally believe that he did. <laughs> um, I don't know if he got saved right here on this night, uh, but I, I believe that he got saved. Now go to John chapter 7. This actually becomes very important in the message, uh, to the message in regards to him being a Pharisee, uh, staying with the, Phar with, with the Pharisees at least up until Jesus' death. We don't know what happened after that, but chapter 7, verse 50. <clears throat> Nicodemus saith unto them... Um, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. Now, it's interesting. They had sent these uh, religious leaders, these officers, to go and arrest Jesus. And they, they came back, they didn't, ha you know, they, they didn't get them. They didn't even try. And so it says in verse 44, some of them would have taken them, but no man laid his hand on him. Verse 45, then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and said unto them, why have ye not brought him? The officer said, never man spake like this man. Then answered them, the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of, uh, or of the Pharisees believed on him? So there's this real question and that would have been a perfect opportunity for Nicodemus to stand up and say, like, well, yeah, I, I do, but he didn't. So, the, so some people have suggested, well, since he didn't openly profess them, then he must not be saved. I, I would disagree with that, but even if he wasn't saved yet, I believe he's certainly observing Christ and thinking about what Christ said, thinking about what he taught, thinking about the miracles. And I would assume that at chap, on chap, by chapter 19, he was a, a disciple of Christ, okay? Chapter 19, verse 39. 
<clears throat> this is after the, well, this is right at the burial of Jesus. After he dies on the cross, we meet a man named uh, Joseph of Arimathea, verse 38. Well, look at verse 38, actually. Here's what it says. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, look at the next word, but secretly. So was Joseph of Arimathea saved? Like, was, was he a believer? I believe that he was but he was doing it secretly because he didn't really want the persecution and everything that came across, which all the disciples of Christ were kind of like that. Uh, then it says, uh, let's see, verse 39, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, uh, about 100 pounds weight. And so anyway, so he was there at the burial of Jesus. We don't know beyond that at the resurrection, you know, was he one of the guys that Jesus appeared to? Um, after the resurrection, is he one that continued to follow on in, uh, you know, being a disciple of Christ? You know, I, I hope so. I don't know for sure, but this is one of those many questions that I have in regards to Nicodemus. But the Bible does give us these three passages that talk about him. And we know it's him because it says, like, the one who came to Jesus by night. And it, and it seems to indicate that he went on, uh, you know, to follow the Lord to some degree, albeit in secrecy. You know, and that and that becomes important because many people might say like, well, yeah, well, if you don't, you know, openly profess Christ, then you're not saved. If you were saved and you were a part of such and such type of false church and you didn't leave that church and join a Baptist church and you're not saved. And, and people will say all kinds of things. I disagree with that. And I think the Bible shows us that that's not the case. There are people who are saved and still living. And, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself. That's one of my points. So, so let's go ahead and talk about what a Pharisee is. We've talked about it a little bit. You kind of are familiar with Pharisees probably, but mostly in our society, when somebody thinks Pharisee, they think of just like a modern day, holier than thou hypocrite, right? Because that's the way everybody uses it. Like, don't be such a Pharisee. And, uh, <clears throat> And there's a, you know, there's a reason for that. There's, there's good grounds for them doing that. But let me explain real quick who, what a Pharisee was. So the word Pharisee, apparently, I don't know, I, I didn't look really deeply at it, but apparently it means like set apart or separated, okay? And, and we can kind of understand that because these guys were, they, strict, they were strictly adhering to the Old Testament law and going above and beyond. And they wanted to be like recognized. And we, they went so far that obviously Christ was calling them out for, loving to be seen by men and wearing the long robes and all these kinds of things. We understand there was a lot of wickedness going on. But at the, at the root of it, they were saying, hey, we are basically like ultra conservatives, right? They were like, we are under the law, old laws, and we believe in the, um, you know, our nation, the Jewish people. We want to preserve their ways. We don't want to be uh, Hellenized, uh, not hell, like, you know, like I'm talking about like uh, adopting the Greek uh, cultures of the day and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and they don't they didn't want to accept that. Okay, so they were more like the ultra conservative, pulling people back to uh, the old ways, and and then they went above and beyond, of course. All right, now there was another sect of uh, of I don't I almost said Christians, but uh, spiritual leaders of that day who were the other extreme. They were more like the liberals. Okay, they were the Sadducees, and they rejected a lot of what the Old Testament taught. And they, you know, didn't agree with a lot of those uh, types of things, but they were religious leaders of the day who we might think of as more like uh, the liberals and they adult adopted the culture of the day. And, uh, but yet they still were against Jesus, okay? So you had the, the right was against Jesus, the left was against Jesus, and, uh, uh, but these were the religious leaders of the day. Now we know that the Pharisees, are the ones, you know, here's Jesus. We read in the stories of Jesus, we love how he's so gracious and so merciful. You know, we love the story about where the, the woman who is uh, supposedly caught in the act of adultery and she's brought to Jesus and he says, you know, like, he who is without sin cast the first stone and then go and sin no more. And we see all this mercy, we see all this love. And, and you can get to this point where you're like, man, did Jesus even preach against sin? Well, yes, of course he did. <laughs> But mostly, and this is what the liberals today will say, like, yeah, but you know who he really preached against were those Pharisees. And so they'll make that application today, like, you know who you know, we ought to be preaching about are those, like, super spiritual, holier than thou, you know, uh, people who, who, you know, have these strict separated rules and all this kind of stuff. 
Now, I would say that to a degree, yes, that should be called out. People who are, um, you know, pushing doctrines onto other people and saying like, hey, you ought to be doing it the way that I'm doing it uh, to the extent of, you know, these are the commandments of God, which they're really not. They're just traditional things that, uh, that these people held to. But the fact that the Pharisees, look, there's a way bigger problem that the Pharisees have than just trying to obey the laws of, of the Old Testament, okay? Uh, the big problem was that, that, that Jesus called them out on is that they, number one, like I said, they were pushing those things onto other people. Like you had to do these things to the extent that we do. But it went a, a little bit beyond that is in that Jesus understood, he knew their heart and, and probably they had a reputation around town even of being hypocrites, meaning that they would say they're holy and they would walk around in their long robes and, and uh, you know, nose up in the air and all that stuff. And when they did, gave their alms, you know, they sound the trumpet and they wanted everybody to see and did all these things, but they were wicked. They were <laughs> doing all kinds of sin, but pretending as though they were righteous and holy and all that. But Jesus never called them out for going above and beyond and obeying the law. Even their strict, you know, you remember that verse where he says, Ye tithe of the mint and the cumin and all this, you know, the, these guys are like so, uh, <clears throat> you know, they're so strict on this that they'll get out their, their spices and they'll divide them up. Okay, here's 10% and I'll tithe that. I guess that's what, what's going on. But what's funny about that passage is, there's, you know, certainly we don't need to do that. We don't need to, to go to that extreme. But Jesus says, hey, you know what? These things all you have done and not left the other things undone, not the things that the weightier matters of justice and, and, all, and, and, all, and mercy and all these. I don't remember the exact how the text goes exactly. Uh, but the point is that Jesus wasn't calling them out because they were strict, because they were separate, because they, uh, you know, were, were trying to be too holy, you know, trying to look religious and all this stuff. Not necessarily. The problem was that they were hypocrites. They were pushing this onto the other people. And yet they were a representation of the Jews. Like this is what people knew of the Jews and their religion was what they were seeing from the Pharisees. And so Jesus, who had come to teach people true religion and to put their trust in him, you know, is fighting these guys who are preaching all this heresy. And then on top of it, they are persecuting him and trying and ultimately going to end up, you know, getting him arrested and put on the cross. And so, yeah, Jesus is speaking out against them. But Nicodemus here, as a Pharisee, is going to represent this group of people who I want to talk about, uh, maybe the Pharisees of the day, the religious people of today. And, and, uh, and so a few points I want to bring about this, a little bit of a different angle from the story. But uh, I want to talk about this. Number one, <coughs> This is kind of a long, uh, long sentence here, but okay. Even the most studied theologians don't understand spiritual things until their spiritual eyes are opened, okay? Even the most studied, the smartest, the wisest, most educated theologians of the day, they don't have a clue about spiritual things, okay? If they're not, if their eyes, spiritual eyes haven't been opened, if they're still lost. And so go back to our text in John, two, uh, John 3 and look at, Verse 9, <clears throat> Jesus is talking about being born again, and that just doesn't seem to be processing in Nicodemus' mind. And so uh, Jesus goes and he explains what that means, and we'll come back to that here in a minute. But, and then verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus <laughs> answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Now, I don't think he's really rebuking him and saying, like, hey, you should understand this. It's so easy. Because in reality, spiritual things aren't easy to the carnal, you know, to the body, to this, to the, this physical body. We can't grasp spiritual things. It's, it's really hard. But I think what he's, the point that he's bringing out here is that, hey, you, let, let's make this clear. You are a master of you know, you got your master's degree, right? Or doctor's degree, whatever. Like you are a master of the laws and of the of this religion, and and you don't even understand this thing. Well, hey, this is a really good point because today, you know, a lot of people will say like, well, you can't just. You've probably heard this. You you, you can't just read through your Bible and and not think about what you're reading and not study it. Okay. Now I I disagree with that. I think everybody should read their Bible. I think reading 
fr from the front cover to the back cover every year. I think it's an excellent practice. I think it's really good to do that way. But some people will say, like, you can't do that. You're not going to learn anything from it. You need to study it, okay? Now, I'm all for studying the Bible, comparing Scripture with Scripture, and, and uh, there's lots of ways to study the Bible. But usually what people mean is you need to read all these books, Right? You need to go to all these commentaries and you need to get all these lexicons and you need to get all this thing. You know, talk. You got to study from these men who know Greek and they know Hebrew and they know all these things and they know all the laws. And you need to study from those guys. Well, here's the thing. If these guys are not saved, they don't have a clue about spiritual things. Now, you could talk. Now, you could listen to a preacher who's lost. And you probably have listened to a lot of them if you've, if you've like flipped through the radio uh, station or something like that. You can listen to a lot of guys that are lost and bring up some very good points from the Bible because they are smart men and they can read the Bible and they can compare scripture and say like, wow, it seems and they can bring up some great points. But when it comes to spiritual things, I'm telling you, if they're lost, they, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> okay. And so we can't rely on the intellectual, you know, the theologians, the smartest people out there. Uh, look, Nicodemus was a master in, what does it say? Master in Israel. Uh, art thou a master? Verse nine. Uh, no, 10. Master of Israel and knowest not these things. Look, look they're, they coming, they're coming to you as an expert, and you don't even know this very uh, uh, simple thing about separating the flesh from the spirit and how that which is from above has to come down. And, and, and anyway, we'll talk about that here in a second, Lord willing. Now, we understand this of, for instance, if you talk to a very educated Catholic, okay, we would, ex we would understand Hey, the Catholics, they believe in transubstantiation, right? They believe that, you know, because Jesus said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. So they're just like, oh, man, you got to really, drink. You know, they're thinking physical, okay? They can't get past that. They can't con uh, contemplate what Jesus is talking about, the, the, the spiritual world. They're just like, okay, well, it really be, has to become blood in, in Jesus' body. So they think that when they take the Lord's Supper uh, or the Eucharist, it becomes his body. And so, so we understand, well, that's because they're blind. That's because they're not saved, right? They, don't, they believe that, you know, all the verses about baptism. And so they're just thinking like, huh, well, there must be something special about water. And, of course, I'm overly simplifying. But, and so there's must, the, you know, you bless the water, it becomes holy water, and it can wash away sins or, or whatever, you know, nonsense there. We understand that because we're like, hey, there's, you know, what do you expect? They're, they're lost. They don't understand, and so that they, 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 you know, they're saying all this kind of weird stuff because they're lost. <clears throat> uh, uh, a lot of Protestants came out of that movement. They began reading their Bible and said, like, these are con contrary to what the Catholics are teaching. And so they broke away from Catholicism, and they started all these different religions or different denominations uh, that we would call Protestant denominations today. And guess what? If you listen to some of them explain salvation, you'll say, well, you're not saved. <laughs> now, I'm glad that you came to the realization that a lot of what the Catholics were teaching was wrong, and so you broke away from that, but you're still not right on the gospel, which means you're, right, you're wrong on a lot of other things. Okay? Now, we would understand it. As, as saved Bible believers, you know, we would say, of course, Catholics, you know, we expect that. Protestants, we expect that. But can I just tell you, that I'm learning more and more every, every day, <laughs> it seems like, that we're in for a surprise. I think there's going to be a lot of Baptist pastors who are unsaved. And my whole life, like, I never would have said that. It's like, well, they're Baptist pastors. They, you know, I'm not going to bring a railing accusation and say they're not saved. Look, if you listen to the words that come out of their mouth and listen to how they preach the gospel, I can only come to the conclusion that a lot of these guys are not saved. So could I listen to some decent stuff that they say? Well, yeah, if they're just passing down what's been taught to them and they're preaching some... Uh, theology, some truth. They read a lot of books. You know, if they're quoting scripture, like obviously that sounds good, and I can I can hear all these things. But then you realize all of a sudden, like, wow, they're not they're not even saved. You know, and it blows your mind. And, and, and it's a it's a terrible thought, but it's just the reality. Even the most studied theologians, if they don't, if if their if their eyes haven't been open to spiritual things, like they are not going to be able to understand the simple truths of the Bible. You know, I had this thought one time, obviously, um, there are a lot of different views on the rapture. And some people believe in, a, you know, a secret rapture where, you know, it's just going to boom, everybody's gone. And then the world's going to stand around scratching their heads like, where did all these Christians go? All right. That's kind of like a popular, popular belief. Now, I'm, I believe in a rapture. I believe that we are going to be caught up in the, in the resurrection and, it, you know, but 
but there are some signs, some things that are going to happen before that. I'm actually going to be talking about that tonight in, uh, in Iola a little bit. Uh, there are some things that are going to happen before that. But anyway, I had this thought one time, though. I was like, you know what? The way that people who, who believe in a secret rapture, the way they explain it, because it's, it's kind of like, well, all right, well, if all the Christians just all of a sudden disappeared, the world's, why wouldn't the world turn to Jesus? Have you ever heard that? Like, why wouldn't they turn to Jesus? Because they're like, whoa, I guess the Christians are right. Like, they're all gone, and so there must have been this rapture that I heard. I, you know, I watched this video, the Left Behind series or whatever. <laughs> so they must be right, you know. And so they come up with these ideas like, well, there's probably going to be aliens, you know, <laughs> like, you know the UFOs. I mean, uh, you know, Trump released some kind of UFO footage and, and, and uh, uh, you know, there's this guy that came out, used to work for the Department of Defense. And, and he's just like, yeah, we've seen UFOs and all this kind of stuff. And so look, there are even there are a lot of Christians that are like, hey, there are UFOs. And, you know, it ties back to Genesis and and all. And, the, and this is something that's going to happen. And and the world's going to see that. And they're going to say, like, hey, that's where the Christians went. They went up and, and, and this kind of thing. All right. Well, here's the thing. I, I, it just dawned on me one day. I was thinking that through. And I was like, you know what? You wouldn't even need anything like that. OK, if there's a secret rapture and all of a sudden all the Christians were gone, There'd be a lot of people who call themselves Christians standing around thinking like, well, it can't be the rapture because I'm here. <laughs> and there'd be a lot of people saying like, well, it can't be the rapture because so-and-so is gone and we know he wasn't saved. <laughs> so the reality is like people like you, you look around society, you really can't tell who's saved and who's not saved. You'd be surprised by some of the people that are saved who you don't think are saved. And you'd be really surprised at some of the people that you think are saved who are not saved. And I think there are a lot, we're going to find out there's a lot of even Baptist pastors who are wrong on salvation and they're not saved. And it's a terrifying thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's heartbreaking to think of that. But, um, but yeah, even the most studied and educated people, look, they don't know what they're talking about. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, man. This is a great, this is a great passage. I want to really do a study uh, Maybe preach a sermon out of it sometime and go a little deeper, but just reading through this, man, it really jumped out at me. And I want to say this, really, I think this verse descri- I think this verse describes what true repentance and in, in, in when it comes to being saved, repenting unto salvation, this this verse describes that. Okay. <clears throat> Look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12. And there's a lot of, the whole chapter is great, but I'm going to start at verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Okay, so stop there for a minute. I'm going to I'm going to pick up. But what he's saying is, look, the Old Testament, you know, the reading of that and all like that never could save anybody. But when Moses received that, you remember he had a veil on on him because, you know, the glory of the Lord had shone and, and it was just so bright and all that. So he had this veil. And so Paul's saying like, hey, you know what? They still have a veil when they read the Old Testament law. They're not really seeing God. They're just like studying these laws and these words and all this kind of stuff, right? So he says, uh, that's still the case whenever they read Moses today. Verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall, okay, I want to read 15 again. And what is it in in verse 16? What is it talking about it? Verse 15 says, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Okay, so we're talking about their heart. Now, I'm sorry, uh, nevertheless, when it, the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Keep reading under chapter 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So basically he's saying, 
I'm sorry, I got to keep reading. In, in, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Okay, so you see this idea of, I love how the Bible always uses salvation as like light, okay? As like you were in darkness and now you, you're not blinded anymore and you see the light, you know, or coming to the light that all may be revealed. Uh, the Bible uses the word enlightened, okay? Somebody has once been enlightened. And so like this, this whole idea of, you know, you can see it in someone's eyes when you're preaching the gospel. I feel like you can see it in somebody's eyes. When that, that moment, whenever it clicks, and it's just like, it's like you almost can literally see the light coming in. It's just like, oh, I get it, right? And they receive that, and they want to pray, and they're happy, and, and all that stuff. And it's just like, hey, you now get it. Like, you can see into the spiritual world. You know that you're saved because of your faith through what Jesus did. And it's not like your own works. It's not any of this confusing stuff that everybody's been trying to figure out from the Bible. No, just through plain speech. I love that how he says that. Through plain speech, we just said, hey, here's the gospel. And, and, and whenever somebody receives that, they're like, man, this is great news. Like, I need to, I need to uh, you know, not faint, and I need to go ahead and renounce the hidden things of dishonesty and not walk in Christ. And so, uh, so true repentance really doesn't have to do with turning from the sins, okay? And I think everybody in here agrees with that. But this repentance is that my heart was hardened. It was had a veil over it. And then whenever it turned to God... It was like it was open minded. Let's say, let's say you're open minded to receive like this plain speech and then it turned to God. And then all of a sudden, like there's this uh, enlightenment that happens. OK, so a lot of even intelligent theologians and, and scholars and all that, they still have that veil over them. They have not been saved and they haven't opened up uh, their spiritual eyes. They're still living in darkness. Okay, so, uh, so Jesus gives this very clear explanation. Go back to John 2. I'm sorry, John 3. <clears throat> he actually gives a very clear explanation of salvation, but, you know, even that, you've heard it explained so many times, and maybe you've quoted it so much that you kind of lost sight of how simple it is. But, you know, he takes him from the first part of this, pas this passage where he's clearly saying, like, hey, you're thinking about the flesh. You're thinking about, hey, there has to be, you know, can I go back in my mother's womb? You know, uh, you're thinking of all these kind of things. He's like, but no, actually being born again has to do with that spiritual person. And that can't be born by anything that you do or anything that you experience. This can only be born by him who was in heaven coming down as a gift, right, and, and giving you this gift the spiritual gift. That's the only way you can be born. You can't do it yourself. You can't, you're just a human, like you're in this body. So you can't do that. God has to do it. Okay. Uh, all you have to do is re receive it whenever you have that opportunity. Okay. So, uh, uh, so he has explained that in the first part. And then verse 11, he says, this is after he says, like, are you a, a master of Israel and don't know these things? Verse 11, verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and we testify what we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things, and ye believe not, how can ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember, he hadn't died on the cross yet. So this is kind of a strange period of time where he's preaching the gospel, but he hasn't actually uh, gone to the cross yet. And then that he says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So you see what he's saying is that you as a human, you're already condemned. Because all have sinned. And the Bible says that, you know, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. First John, if you say you have not sinned, you're, you're a liar, right? You've deceived yourself. Uh, you, if you say you have no sin, because all of us have sinned, and I would say, you know, continue to sin. There's no way that you could say, like, yeah, but once I turn my faith to the Lord, like, I just ceased from sinning. Like, no, no, well, then you must not know what a sin is. <laughs> like, you must not know, like, there's no way that you've done that. Certain things might have changed, you know, 
but uh, but but it all hasn't come. I, I I'll, I'll try to be real fast on this, but you know, a while back, uh, I don't know, a, year, a few years ago, you know, a guy was uh, messaging me, and and I've talked about it a few times, but he was messaging me and he's calling me out for uh, believing that you can get saved without changing your life, right? And it was really weird because he's a Baptist, he's a well-known Baptist preacher, and and uh, pretty well known around these parts anyway. And, uh, you know, he'll use a lot of the right wording and he'll tell all his friends the right, you know, he'll say the right things so that they'll believe that. But when he was telling me, he was like, man, you guys are sending people to hell because you're not preaching that they need to, uh, you know, turn from their sins and they need to do all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and I was literally thinking in my mind, like what I'm saying in this passage, like, is, is he got a veil? Why can't he get this? Has he got like a veil over his face? Like, like, why is he saying that there has to be these changes? And finally, at the end of our conversation, he was like, you know, when I got saved, I poured the alcohol down the drain and I got a haircut and I did this and I did that. And it's like what he just literally said was, I got saved and I know I got saved because I did X, Y, Z. And I'm not going to believe that anybody else is saved if they don't do X, Y, Z. Guess what that's called? A workspace salvation. Right? And guess what that is? That's not understanding that you can only be spiritually born from what Jesus did. And it has nothing to do with this physical body whatsoever. And so he was just like spiritually like, like blind. It's like, is there a veil over your, your face? I don't understand why you can't see this, okay? And so uh, and Jesus is, is, is making it as plain and as simple as he can. All you have to do is trust in me because you can't figure it out in, the, in, the, in this body. You can't do the works to earn it in this body. You can't. All you have to do is by faith say, huh, Jesus came. He was that mediator between God and man. You know, he was the God and he was man and he's the one that can bridge that gap. And I'm just going to trust in him. He said, if I believe in him, you know, then I'll, I'll be saved. And I like once you get that through faith, those spiritual eyes are open and you're a, you're a, you're a new creature inside. OK, so uh, so the, Jesus actually makes it very clear in this passage. All right, let me just move on to my next point here. So uh, the second point I want to say is this. OK, so first of all, we can learn from this story that here is Nicodemus spiritual leader, knew the Old Testament law, knew all those things, and yet still just blinded, doesn't understand spiritual things. Number two, this is an important point to make, okay? Not every Pharisee was a reprobate. Not every Pharisee was just naturally just going to hell because they were just these wicked Pharisees, okay? And this is what we can get from the story uh, of Nicodemus and other Pharisees in the Bible. Uh, let's see, Paul the Apostle, right? He was a Pharisee, but he got saved. OK, so now at the same time, yeah, some of the Pharisees were reprobates. OK, go to chapter 12. And I think everybody here is familiar with the, the doctrine of what we would call the reprobate doctrine or whatever, which is this, this, uh, this idea that somebody can get to this point where they reject God. I guess you could say for the last time, like they, they, they finally hardened their, hardened their heart to the point where it's like, okay, it's so calloused, it's so hardened, they cannot receive the truth, okay? And so God gives up on them and says like, hey, you know what? I'm still going to use you for, for bad things, wicked things in this world, but I'm, and I'm going to just turn you over to all these things and you're going to be, the God of this world is going to use you, but you know, you, you're not going to call out to me, you're not going to be saved, uh, you're without hope at this point. That's a hard thing for Christians to grasp or to, or to think about, that like God would ever give up on somebody. But as the Bible's very clear on it, it talks about it many times, Romans 1 being the clearest one. Okay, so, uh, but look at chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 37. <clears throat> but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom uh, hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Now, you know, Calvinists will say, like, well, that's just God deciding, like, I'm going to turn them over to a reprobate mind because I don't want them to be saved. That's really weird to say that God would not want somebody to be saved when it's, the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. Okay? Right. But the, they'll take these verses and say, like, well, I guess God just wanted to destroy him and didn't want him to be saved. Well, that's true, but it's only true because they, in their free will, decided to reject God. 
okay, and, uh, and their hearts were hardened, and so he turns them over to a reprobate mind. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel two verse twenty five. <clears throat> of course, this is uh, this is the story of Eli, who was the priest, and he had his own problems. But the main problem God had with him is that he allowed his sons to continue being uh, ministering there in the temp in the tabernacle. And he says, verse twenty four, "Nay, my sons, for it is uh, no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress." Verse 25, if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat him? And look at this next part. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Now, the only reason I can, the only sense I can make out of that, in comparison to other scriptures that talk about this, is that the, is they were destined now to be slain by God and not to get right, not to turn to God, because their hearts had already rejected God. And we can see that in the, you know, in, the, in the earlier passages. We can see that with all these guys. We can see that with Pharaoh. We're not going to take the time to go there. But Pharaoh, you know, Moses is, is trying to say, hey, I've talked with God, and, and he wants you to let my people go and all this stuff. And Pharaoh's like, who is God that I would obey him? Who is God that I would hearken him? And he totally hardens his heart. And so later on when the Bible says God hardens his heart, it's like, well, yeah, but he had already, he had already rejected God. Okay, so now God's doing what Romans 1 says, turning him over to a reprobate mind. Now, interestingly, there, you know, I believe that there's two different types of, of reprobates out there, okay? And, uh, and I think the Bible describes these. I can't find one a verse that says, yeah, there are two different types. But I think just comparing Scripture to Scripture, you know, you could, look, you could even look around and you can identify these people and, and back it up with Scripture and say, like, man, these guys, everything about them just says that they're a reprobate because they're just so openly just living in wickedness and filth and like they don't care. They do like all manner of evil. They won't listen. They mock God and all these kinds of things. And you can say like, I think that person's a reprobate. I mean, I realize we don't know for sure. We don't know their heart, but you can say like, I think that person's a reprobate based on God's word. But then there's this other kind that's almost like more dangerous. That's a reprobate who have has also rejected God and has also been turned over to a reprobate mind. But here's how they deal with it. Instead of just giving over themselves over to all manner of wickedness, which they, they still do, but they mask it. And they become these religious leaders and they become these false prophets and these, and these uh, uh, you know, spiritual, uh, you know, taking, taking advantage of God's people and all this kind of stuff. And we see that all throughout the Bible. In fact, those are the guys, again, that Jesus gets most worked up about and wants to call people's attention to you know, identify these people so that they uh, can't do more damage because they're these hard, they, they've hardened their hearts and they are um, just become reprobate. Now, now some of, so we understand this, that some of the Pharisees were, they did fit this category, I would say. Just like some of the, the just wicked sinners that Jesus just talked to that, you know, didn't even claim to be religious, you know, they might have been reprobate, but not all of them. And so the Bible actually, or not the Bible, but history show, uh, tells us, like Josephus, if you can trust anything he had to say, uh, he claims that uh, like there were 6,000 Pharisees. I don't know where he gets that number, but there were like 6,000 Pharisees. Let's say that's true. That's a lot of people. And a lot of them during that time of Christ were like walking with him and watching his, you know, questioning him and watching his miracles and, and listening to his preaching and all that. And you mean to tell me every single one of those, just because they were a Pharisee, you know, had their hearts hardened and, the, and they were in their reprobate? I obviously, I don't believe that. I believe that there were, and we see some getting saved. We see the Apostle Paul later getting saved. You know, I think that Nicodemus gets saved. And so this is a, uh, in fact, Philippians 3, 5, Paul says he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Like he was just hardcore. Like he kept all the laws and yeah, I bet you he tithed his cumin and mint. <laughs> You know, something we might look and say, there are spiritual leaders today out in this world. And we can identify and we can say, man, this person's wicked. And they're preaching false gospel. You know, they're leading people astray. You know, they're getting caught up in all these weird religion, uh, real, weird teachings or whatever. But wait a minute, does that necessarily mean that they are reprobate? I would say no. It means they're, spiritual, they're spiritually blind. And so they can't even receive, they can't even understand these simple truths of God's word because they're spiritually blind but not necessarily reprobate. Now there's a line somewhere and maybe there's some biblical, there's some verses we can look, hey, I identify this person must be reprobate because they're teaching such, uh, such, such and such or they did such and such. 
But I'm just saying that just because somebody is this very intelligent uh, person who's leading others astray with this false teaching, because that was going on a lot and it has always gone along a lot. They just need to have their spiritual eyes opened. Okay. <clears throat> and so here's why I say it. Cause sometimes we'll be not, I mean, I'm saying it just because it's in, that's where I feel like this text is, is, is taking me. But when we knock on doors, I can say there are times that somebody's like, well, I'm the pastor of such and such, right? Male or female. doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm the pastor at such and such, right? In my heart, like, or in my mind, I should say, a lot of times I'm like, all right, this person's like, nah, this is a lost cause. Like they, they've already got their mind made up. They know what they believe. Uh, I'll just say a couple of things and I'll be like, have a nice day. And I'll just go on. But you know what? That person could honestly be seeking the Lord, <laughs> you know, they, to some degree, you could be that person who's supposed to show them like, Hey, no, 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 you're, you're wrong on this. And I know I'm not, you know, I, I don't have as many years in the ministry as you, and I don't have as much, you know, Bible education as you, but let, let me show you what the, what the word says. It's quite possible you could get those people saved. We've had people, uh, we've had people on, out soul winning and get pastors saved. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely something that we shouldn't give up on them and just be like, well, every person that's not preaching the right gospel, they're just, I'm just done with them. No, in love, show them, try to win them over and say like, hey, here's what the Bible teaches. And I just want to make sure that you understand this. And, the, you know, you could lead somebody to the Lord uh, who has just been blinded and hasn't yet realized uh, this, is, uh, this is the truth. Okay. Last point is this. I'll be real fast here. Okay. Not every Pharisee will immediately walk away from other Pharisees. Okay. We see that Nicodemus is still hanging around these other Pharisees and still kind of like secretly following Christ, but still, you know, hanging out with these people. And I hate it and it bothers me. And, and, and honestly, I, I don't even completely understand it because, you know, it's not, it, it's not really that hard. I, I, I don't know. Maybe there was a time where there was, but at, at some point in your life, you get to this point, like, Hey, what's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. Okay. And if I've been shown the truth and I know this is right and people are going to just like, uh, shun me or, or, you know, not want anything to do with me because I'm pre I'm, I'm preaching the truth. Like I, it, just the situation that I'm in, maybe just the support of a family. May, I, I don't know what the case is. Other friends that are like-minded or whatever. Like, I don't understand the problem. Just walk away and let those people, let those people go. But you know, the truth is not everybody, not everybody has the, the ability to do that. I mean, everyone has the ability to do it. Not everyone does it. Okay. Some people, you know, maybe they're religious, they're, they're involved in some kind of religion, teaching false gospels, uh, gospel or whatever. And, you know, you've, you've, you've talked to them. All right, here's an example. Like this, several times this has happened. You're talking to somebody and they say like, well, yeah, I go to the Catholic church. And you're just like, all right, I'm going to give this person the gospel. And they're like, I already know what you're, you can see it in their eyes. There's like, that enlightenment I was talking about. I already know what you're going to say. I already know what you're going to say. Yeah, I am saved. Well, how do you know that you're saved? And you're waiting for them to say like, well, I got to confess my sins and I got to take the, you know, stay in God's graces. So, you know, so I don't have to go to purgatory or whatever. And they, and they give you the right answer. Well, because I received Jesus Christ as my savior, I put my trust in him. I know it's not my works. It's just his righteousness. I, and, and no, I can't lose my salvation. And you're just like, you just said you went to Catholic church. Yeah. Well, you know, when I got married, my so-and-so went to this church and I felt like I had to go to this church. And so they just got stuck there. You and I are probably like, why wouldn't you leave? <laughs> why wouldn't you leave that church? You know, they're, they're teaching a false gospel. But, you know, to them, they've just made a decision. And, and it's a bad decision. But they've just made a decision like, hey, I don't want to, I don't want, you know, uh, drama with my family and all this kind of stuff. And so I'm going to stay there. But I still know in my heart that I'm saved. I trusted the Lord. You know, there's a lot of people that would say like, well, I don't think they're really saved because they didn't walk away from that. Well, that sure doesn't seem to be what the Bible shows us because we show the Bible. Like there were people in the Old Testament, and I realize we're in the New Testament, but people in the Old Testament who hung on to false idols. Even after, you know, after they followed the Lord, they had false idols and they got rebuked and they got in trouble, but they, you know, they were still kind of turning to these things. And, and it's weird. Like why would God, you know, you, you, you would say, no, there's no way that somebody could do that if they're saved. But I'm going to tell you, uh, a person is spiritually born by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, whatever this flesh does, because this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, you know, whatever the flesh does, because we can grieve the spirit and we can, we can quench the spirit. 
uh, that's another matter, right? And that is something that one day we will be judged according to our works. We will be granted, uh, you know, certain gifts for our righteousness, and we will, uh, you know, certainly be laying up treasures in heaven. But some people, for whatever reason, just like, hey, I'm not willing to go down that road. I'm not willing to commit to that degree. I don't want to lose family and friends and all that stuff. I want to just stay here, even though I know what the truth is. It's sad, okay? They shouldn't do that. Uh, but there are a lot of people that do that. doesn't mean they're, they're reprobates. Uh, doesn't mean that they didn't truly believe. It just means that they just weren't str- they're just not strong enough. Yet, maybe, maybe they can still be pulled out of that. So it is true that much of Jesus' anger was toward the religious rulers of the day. He didn't like false doctrine. He didn't like people uh, using the Lord's name in, in vain or, or, uh, or you know, uh, using religion as a, plat- as a false platform. And we shouldn't be happy with it today either. Like, we should be upset about those things. Last week we talked about having a zeal for God's house. And, uh, and we should have a zeal. It, sh- it should upset us. But at the same time, um, we need to remember that most of them are just blinded and haven't come to the truth yet. It's sad, you know, but in the, in the, the garbage that's coming out of their mouth and the, uh, the false teachings that are coming out of their mouth, it's just like they're blinded. They need to be saved. Now, could it be that they're a reprobate and they've already hardened their heart? It's definitely possible. You know, you can only preach the gospel to somebody so many times and they can reject it so many times, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are. We can continue to and should preach the gospel and try to, to win them over to the truth. Okay, but if they don't receive Christ, then they're, they're spiritually blind. They're going to believe all kinds of weird stuff. Okay, um, and then, you know, they're not any more likely to be a reprobate than that person who's just living a wicked lifestyle and, and, uh, and doing all this, all this filth and, and all that stuff. Okay, both sides could be reprobate, right? Depends on whether they cross that line or not. Or they might not be reprobate. All we can do is preach the gospel, make it very plain, very clear, and uh, and don't let somebody just because they believe a false gospel, uh, don't just dismiss them like, well, they're already condemned to hell. Well, look, everybody's condemned, okay, if they're not saved yet. We need to be preaching the true gospel and get them saved. <clears throat> Many can and will uh, still get saved, but unfortunately, that doesn't mean that they'll walk away from their crowd. And it's sad when they don't. Like every, every single person that gets saved, I'm always like, why, why didn't they come to our church? Like you would think like the person that got me saved, I'd want to go to that church. They actually brought me the truth, right? But that's just not how the world works. It's like, well, man, thank you. That was nice. You know, uh, 10 lepers. Well, thank you for giving, you know, healing my leprosy. Now I'm going to go on my merry way and just forget all about you, <laughs> right? It's sad. It shouldn't be that way. Uh, but that's the reality. There, there are saved people who just continue uh, going the wrong direction. But they're, but they're still saved, all right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, your word. Thank you for the book of John, such a great book. Uh, we can learn so much from it. And I uh, thank you, Lord, for the examples. We certainly know um, uh, that there's people out there living just this in ignorance of, of you and living in, in uh, just a, a wicked life who we can identify that they need the gospel. But help us understand also that there are uh, religious people out there and people who are just way off on, on the Bible and on the gospel, who, who seemingly live decent lives, but they're just they, they, they're, they're false teachers. But, Lord, they also need the gospel. So help us just to keep our minds straight and our doctrine straight and follow the Spirit, but also help us very clearly preach the truth and love people enough to give them the truth. And I pray you be glorified by those efforts and you lead us and guide us and keep us from error and harm. Uh, We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, get your song.